Now for our next talk, uh, we have Trevor Carlson, uh, who uh, I think his talk ties very, very well to sampling memory systems and then <laughs> what can you do after that, simulation. Uh, uh, and Trevor um, uh, graduated with a PhD from Ghent University. He's now at Uppsala uh, doing research uh, uh, at uh, uh, the uh, architecture team, with the architecture team. And he's going to talk to you about simulation for medicals. <laughs> OK, thanks a lot, Stefano. Um, OK, um, good afternoon, everyone. A uh, little bit after lunch now, so hopefully, uh, uh, hopefully we're all ready for next talk. Um, what I wanted to talk a little bit about today, I'm going to take a little bit of a deep dive and go into a little bit of technical details of some of the work that's dear to my heart. And, whoops. <laughs> and of course, um, this work uh, was done in collaboration with um, many other people uh, at Ghent University. Um, but what I, what I wanted to do was take, take a step and go a, a step further from what Eric was talking about earlier. So Eric's talking about uh, modeling, uh, modeling a system, understanding a system. And what we're trying to do here is we're trying to see how do we do this uh, for a multi-threaded system? How do we do this for a very complex machine? If it's embedded, if it's HPC, if it's general purpose, um, these um, things should apply to all those, uh, all those different processors. So let's, uh, let's look at this infrastructure. So future hardware and software, what we want to do is we want to design the processor of tomorrow. Well, at least uh, that's one thing that I'm looking to do. Um, but also we want to optimize this next generation software. Okay, so we have two things that we want to do. We want to create new hardware platforms. We also want to create new software that will run well on these hardware platforms. We want to do this in a parallel, we want to do this for parallel software, right? For multi-threaded software that's running on multi-core systems. How do we do this? Um, it's, a, it's actually a very uh, difficult problem, but um, these design, the design complexity and the uh, number of design options can be very large. So how do we do this in a fast way? How do we do this in, in a timely manner? Do we need simulation? So I'm coming from the simulation world here, and simulation can be quite slow. Uh, Eric was mentioning before, we want to do this on a real system. It's quite fast. But there are some limitations to that. You might not be able to get all of the minute details of your architecture. You might not be able to see the complex interactions, all of the complex interactions. You might be able to get a nice estimate of them. Um, but maybe there's some detail that you really would like to know. And that's when simulation can really help out. So we want to evaluate future hardware. But doing that on current hardware, that can be difficult. Um, performance counters are not, alone, not always sufficient. And um, if we want to change, uh, if we want to change the software or the microarchitecture, using performance counters won't always give you all the information you need. Also, if you change the memory hierarchy, like the caches that was mentioned before, you want to add more cache, you larger, smaller, maybe you change your application. You want to be able to measure the effect of this. And there are lots of techniques that allow you to do this, but can you do it in a way, um, can you do it in a very precise way? So, and that's sort of the question that we're going to answer today, or try to answer today anyway. Analytical modeling is a very good start. So in this case, with analytical modeling, this was Eric was mentioning, we build up a statistical model of an application. And with that model, we can quickly evaluate the performance of new machines, um, new hardware microarchitectures, for example, uh, but there are some limitations. And it turns out that new microarchitectural insights, um, when, you when you want to have an analytical model for those, they're always a little bit lagging behind. So if you want to model something state of the art, brand new, then uh, the analytic models can lag a little bit. And this is the case with very complex, multi-threaded, multi-core machines right now. It can be difficult to model these analytically. So this is another reason why we'd want to use simulation. OK, now we have these multi-core systems. We have large numbers of them. We have multi-threaded applications like OpenMP or OpenCL. And in addition, we have um, 
we have this chip performance that's growing, so these larger numbers of cores. But simulation itself, and that's what we're targeting because we want detailed analysis of our application and of, micro, of our microarchitecture. Traditional simulation is single-threaded. It's not scaling with your multi-core processor. So now we have this gap, ever-growing gap. If you don't have a multi-threaded simulator, how do you solve this gap? OK, so we mentioned a little bit about analytical modeling. And interval modeling is one type of analytical model that allows us to understand a processor core, an out-of-order processor core. Um, using analytical modeling, we can speed up simulation. And um, we've done this in some of our work using the Sniper multi-core simulator. But that's a separate talk, and that's orthogonal from the talk that we're going to, uh, that what I'll be talking about today. Today, what we want to talk about is workload reduction, and we want to do this with sampling. Now, 10 years ago, there were a lot, there's a lot of papers on sampling, SMARTS, uh, SimPoint, but there were some limitations with those works. They don't support multi-threaded, um, they support multi-threaded applications, and the uh, updates to SMARTS only support server workloads. So how do you support applications that we're looking are going to be the target workload for these multi-core applications, for these multi-core systems. So today we're going to be talking about these two sampling methodologies, general purpose multi-threaded sampling and application-specific multi-threaded sampling. I'm going to show a little bit of the trade-offs and the benefits uh, for each of these and show that we can, by using these sampling methodologies, we can now estimate performance and other metrics for um, large, com large numbers of applications and uh, a large number of microarchitecture co combinations. OK, so single-threaded sampling is understood, I think, today. Use a small percentage. You, you, you um, simulate a very small percentage of the actual application. And what you do is you select the representative regions. You know in advance the representative regions, and you just simulate those parts. And you can extrapolate the entire application performance. And so SimPoint is one methodology that allows you to do this. So basically, you have an application. It runs, in this case, maybe five seconds. You chop it up into five parts. And now what we've identified is that the red regions are very similar, the blue regions are very similar, and the green region stands alone. And so now we only need to simulate three regions instead of five. So perfect. Um, in, in reality, instead of uh, reduction, of two-fifths, or instead of only simulating three-fifths of the application, we'd only simulate one percent, half a percent, much uh, a very small portion of the application. And then we can still get a very good understanding about how the application performs on a particular microarchitecture. Um, SMARTS is a similar methodology. Uh, instead of identifying ahead of time the application, you periodically sample the application over time. OK, now here's the problem. Applications for multi-core systems they're multi-threaded. They're synchronizing. They are uh, OpenMP-style applications. They use mutexes, barriers. Um, they're working together to solve a common problem. Maybe it's conjugate gradient. Maybe it's FFT, something like this. Um, there's some complexities here. Um, multi-threaded applications can lead to different performance per thread, even for homogeneous applications. This is a very interesting uh, observation. But threads can also sleep when they're waiting for other threads. So these, these complexities were not uh, the original methodologies, original sampling methodologies, were not able to take these into account, these complexities for multi-core. So can we simply, can we simply apply these single-threaded uh, techniques? Um, basically, they use instruction count. And instruction count is a poor metric for performance in the multi-core world. Now we care about runtime. And these old, met these old uh, um, the original uh, sampling methodologies, they did not need to worry about runtime. And so their methodology uh, assumes that instruction count uh, is sufficient. And unfortunately, in the multi-core world, it's not. So there is the first, I'd say the first true multi-threaded sampling technique is something uh, called SMARTS, the upgraded version of SMARTS. And what this allowed people to do was take a server workload that have independent threads. They're completely working independently. And you can use the same uh, methodology, which is periodically 
over time, you take little snapshots of your application to try to understand the overall picture. Okay, sort of uh, in, uh, you're extrapolating your performance. The issue here, and this, this works really well, if there's no explicit communication between threads. But the kind of workloads that we're looking at that communicate and we're trying to work towards a single workload, now it breaks the assumptions of smarts. Uh, and there's some other works like dynamic sampling, which when you're fast forwarding, don't synchronize. And so this is, a, this is also another issue that we try to address. So this boils down to something I'm calling today the four pillars of multi-threaded sampling. We need to make sure we fast forward in time, not instructions, because you can have threads that idle. We need to take into account per thread progress, because each thread can now, with different cache hierarchies, go at different speeds, with NUMA effects, you can see different performance on different threads. We also need, when we're jumping between regions, detailed, fast forward, detailed, we need to be able to take into account the synchronization effects that the applications are experiencing. And finally, we, under, we need to understand phase behavior. And I'll go into this in a bit more detail, but I think that this phase behavior is one of the more important insights that we were able to uncover with our research here. So fast forwarding in time uh, is pretty uh, straightforward. Basically, you can have a spin lock, a spin loop. If you're spinning, your CPI will go crazy. You can achieve almost the maximum CPI of your, your uh, I mean, the lowest CPI or highest IPC of your processor. But you're not doing any useful work. So what we want to do is we want to say, we want to be able to classify or at least be able to view the amount of useful work that you're doing. You can also have DVFS changes. And we've seen this in uh, lots of the other presentations. Your, maybe your mobile phone is going down to 300 megahertz instead of 2.5. Well, instructions are different now when we're at the level of 300 megahertz versus 2.5 gigahertz. And so one of the conclusions that we came to with our work is that you need a work-based metric. And in this case, it's the runtime of the entire application. This is how you judge, um, this is how you judge the amount of work that's being done. And this will therefore eliminate the problems with spin locks, for example, uh, spin loops. OK, synchronizing during fast forwarding. Um, there was an interesting paper that used information from a JIT that was running a microarchitectural simulator. And what it did was it looked for changes in how the application was behaving by monitoring the JIT that the simulator was running in. OK. So it was slightly complex, but it allowed them to do some interesting tricks. But one of the trade-offs that they had to make was they could no longer synchronize during fast-forward periods. So now you had threads that could be proceeding in different rates on different uh, cores. And this actually led to uh, significant uh, runtime prediction errors. So we find that this is very important. Uh, and this is a little example. So we have a detailed region, and we have a fast-forward region. Okay? And the squiggly lines represent the performance of this application. Now, when you're sampling, what you're doing is you're going into a fast-forwarding phase where you don't, you're able to, uh, in a very fast way, skip a bunch of instructions. But because we have synchronizing applications, we still have sleeping, we still have waking, and waiting of applications. So if you have this thread on the top, it waits, and the thread on the bottom wakes it up, the time that this, uh, the amount of time that this takes is actually still important. And so in the previous work with um, uh, dynamic sampling, they, they didn't take this into account. Uh, and it actually, yeah, it, as I mentioned, it uh, can lead to significant errors. OK, so per thread progress, um, this is basically when we have barrier synchronization, you now need to wait for the performance of every single thread. So say you're running an OpenMP application, you want to take advantage of your multi-core, and one thread is lagging behind. Well, that matters to the overall performance of your, of your system. So you can have your NUMA cache effects, and also pipelined applications will see this effect. OK. Now, this is the um, most interesting part, I think, of this work. So I'm going to slowly build up 
sampling error. So on the bottom, we have two regions. We have a detailed region, and we have a fast-forwarding region. And the fast-forwarding region, the length of that, we call it the fast-forwarding forwarding multiplier. And that is a multiplier on the length of the detailed region. Okay. So what we have here is a heat map. And on the bottom axis, on the x-axis, we have the how large our detailed region is. And on the y-axis, we have how big our multiplier, our fast-forwarding multiplier is. Okay? So what we're doing is we're constructing a very basic sampling methodology here for multi-threaded applications. So what does our intuition tell us? Now, that the colors on the right, the lighter colors, yellow, is good, very low error. Darker colors, purples and blacks, mean that's very high error. So our intuition tells us that as we increase this fast-forwarding region, we should see something like this. We should see the error increase, right? This is okay. We're fast-forwarding a longer amount of time. They're going to this is going to introduce error into our overall simulation, and therefore we won't have the right prediction. But in fact, we saw something like this really counterintuitive. It didn't make any sense to us at the time. And um, my professor said, this is wrong. This is completely, uh, you must have something wrong in your simulation. Infrastructure is wrong. This doesn't make sense. There should be one number here that works, and there's nothing. OK, it turns out that applications are periodic. And these a this application periodicity, when doing this type of fast forwarding, matters. So this is. Uh, NAS parallel benchmarks, it uses OpenMP, and it's the FT class A input using eight threads. So this is your running your FFT on your multi-core cell phone, and there are three phases that we can see. On the top, we have the coarse grain phases, and we see two other phases here. Um, you can also look at them, uh, look at the phases in another way. You can look at it as the periodicity, or how often the instructions repeat. And so we can see these two arrows on the right. This application has a periodicity of uh, 550,000 instructions and 1.14 million instructions. So this is how often that those uh, periods repeat in the application. OK, so why is this a problem? Well, it's very simple. It's aliasing. When you have a detailed region and you sample at exactly the periodicity of that detailed region, everything's OK. You're fine, because your detailed region is exactly one period and you project that out. But if you, pr if you sample at a maybe slightly smaller de uh, region compared to your detailed region, now what you're doing is you have this, uh, or maybe slightly larger in this case, the IPC that you're computing is higher. So that line now is above what it should be. And this means that you're, you're, you're introducing artificial sampling error. Well, why, doesn't this, why isn't this um, aliasing problem seen in single-threaded applications? This is weird, right? Why would we only see this problem from multi-threaded sampling? Well, it turns out with the SMARTS uh, implementation, you're taking 10,000 samples, so it doesn't really matter. You're not really, you're averaging out these small problems. Uh, SimPoint uses very large regions of instructions, hundreds of millions of instructions. So when you do this, um, you actually don't, uh, you, you're larger than the average periodicity of your application. Um, so in the end, what we decided to do was define sampling pattern, uh, patterns based on the application itself. So these red lines indicate the application periodicity that we found. And the runtime limits is on the right of the application. And so you can see there's a good region right here. This good region is where we want to sample. So the x-axis is the detailed, and the um, y-axis is the multiplier. So you see if we sample at a detailed, of a, a detailed region of 100 microseconds with a multiplier between 10 and 100, we'll get pretty good results. But if not, if you, if you move into the 1 millisecond range or the 10 millisecond range, we're going to start aliasing with the periodicity of the application really interesting. So you want to avoid that region, and you want to go for some region like this, where we're seeing the lowest error. OK. And um, the results were pretty good. Uh, error is quite low, less than three, around 3.5%. And on average, we simulated less than 14% of the application.
So now what this enables us to do is simulate an application, simulate a multi-threaded application, and understand it at the level of detail of a microarchitectural simulator. And now we can look at larger numbers of software applications and microarchitectural uh, uh, configurations. But we wanted to go a little bit further, and I'll, I'll talk about this. This is a good start, but maybe we can do better because 10x, that's nice. 20x, that's nice. But come on, where's 100x speed up? That's what we saw with the original SimPoint implementation. So we want something that looks like SimPoint, where you can simulate just 1% or maybe smaller of an application, but do it for a multi-threaded application that we're, that we're targeting on our multi-core, eight-core Qual uh, Qualcomm processor in our pocket. So we want the simulation time not to be on the order of instructions, but we want it to be on the order of representative regions. And we want it to be fast, of course, easy to use, of course. Um, and as I explained earlier, multi-threaded sim points is not a valid solution. Um, but what did we notice? We saw that many of these parallel applications use a programming technique called OpenMP. OpenMP uses barrier-based synchronization. And well, what you can see here on this graph is that many of these inputs, for, so this is for um, um, Parsec and Nest Parallel Benchmarks, uh, A input set, which is a pretty small one, actually. Um, but you see the barriers. You see some, I don't know, 1,000, almost 10,000 range. So what, is, what are we trying to do with this? Well, here's that graph from SimPoint again. Instead of representative regions based on instructions, we want to take representative regions based on barriers. And then we look at similarities, and we only execute those barrier-based regions. And we call these barrier points. And what's a barrier point? Well, uh, it's a single inter-barrier region from barrier start until barrier wake. Um, and now, what, well, where does this place us in the realm of sam uh, sampling solutions? So what's interesting is if you're, if you're running a native application, say this takes 1,000 seconds, a really long time. It's a red bar, so it's bad. And if we do our original time-based sampling, we might get a 10 or 20x, maybe, maybe 40x speed up. But it's the simulation time is based on the order of number of instructions that you're simulating, of the number of instructions of the application. If you do workload-specific methodologies, and I hinted to this earlier, smarts and server-based workloads, where there's no communication between threads, they've already solved this problem. But it's workload-specific. And they're able to get quite fa a very fast speed up. So what do we do? We're using a workload-based approach, but for compute-intensive workloads, HPC-style workloads. Uh, in this case, so the slowest thread matters, not the average user IPC. Um, I'll quickly go over the methodology. I'm running a little bit low on time. But um, well, the idea is you have some upfront costs where you do profiling, static profiling, uh, dynamic profiling of the application. You then have um, your simulation where you simulate the representative regions on the microarchitecture of interest. And then finally, you rebuild your application runtime or metric of interest. Um, going to skip over this a little bit, but one of the contributions we uh, were able to make was um, when you're doing characterization of your regions, the characterization traditionally has been done based on instruction count. But what we notice is that data dependency matters just almost as much as instruction count does. And actually, by looking at the reuse distance, and this is what Eric brought up earlier, by looking at reuse distance, or LRU stack distance, you can now have a better understanding of an application's periods and the application um, breakdown. And you can better classify your application. Okay. In the end, you get something like this. You reconstruct your runtime based on the barrier point runtime and a multiplier. So it's actually quite simple, and it looks almost like the SimPoint uh, methodology. OK, and the result is something like this. On top, we have the application itself, the original run to completion. And uh, the middle graph is the reconstructed runtime, the reconstructed aggregate IPC over all eight cores. 
And on the bottom, we show uh, the gray, the dark um, gray regions are the selected barrier points. So in this case, we only need to simulate six of those regions, um, seven of those regions, to actually reconstruct the entire application. Um, this results graph shows a pretty good example where we have a so this is a case where when you do a case study and you're trying to understand if you want to put more cores or more cache on your um, on your processor, you look you might look at something like this. Um, what we're doing is um, we're comparing the speed up of a, of an eight core with a 32 core machine. What's interesting about this is that we're only increasing the number of cores by four, but CG has an increase in performance by 20x over the original application. So why is that? Well, actually, a better um, example here would have just increased the cache size. So CG is able to, the, the, once CG becomes cache fitting, which is the case, um, once you go to 32 cores, then you can get significant uh, performance improvements. And so this is the kind of case study that you want to be able to do. And these kind of sampling techniques enable these new types of case studies. Um, yeah, and an interesting uh, result is that uh, barrier point. So we said before, oh, we can get 20 or 30x with original the original sampling methodology. But barrier point allows an 80x improvement for just this selection of benchmarks that we've seen. With an 80x, I would say, is quite quite good with almost a 900x performance uh, improvement on a uh, maximum. Okay, and I'd like to leave this off with just one. Um, point, which is there are lots of research opportunities here. So we have workload specific, for example, server workload sampling. We have um, other um, workload specific application. Uh, so this is the barrier point, which I just introduced. And what I'm wondering, and it's a question, is are there other workload specific sampling methodologies that we can use? that takes advantage of application behavior and allows us to improve uh, simulation performance for simulators. And so maybe in the future we'll together find the answer to this question. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Well, uh, you ask the best question, so. <laughs> <laughs> So, any other questions? Um, have you done any or any planning on doing uh, um, simulation models for messaging programming paradigms like we heard of? Or do you mean like MPI or? Uh, like Erlang. Like Erlang. Yeah. Like Erlang. Or Scala or so. So currently this implementation is, we, we looked at bar barriers as a low-hanging low fruit. We said, can, can we improve performance significantly there? And we feel that the OpenMP style approach will also apply to things like MPI barriers, where you stop the world and you can do uh, profiling for different barrier regions of an MPI application. So this methodology will up should apply to multi-threaded applications that have interaction through barriers. So what I'm not familiar with is the programming, um, the communication style between Erlang um, threads, you see? With general purpose, multi-threaded sampling, it will work for sure. Um, now, if you're using, if the tasks are completely separate, now you can go to traditional smarts sampling where there's no communication between threads, and that um, sampling methodology has worked well for sa the sampling of server workloads, and it would work well for Erlang workloads that don't communicate between threads. So if that's the programming style that you're using, then that methodology would work there. Would that uh, solve that issue or no? No, it would. Okay, perfect. So that would be, and we can take it offline and talk more if you're interested to hear more about that. 
I think you brought up uh, some really good question. How do you do this pair you know, uh, model, communication model? And uh, you, uh, you're right. There is a lot of uh, research opportunities here. Erlang is shared nothing, but uh, the tasks communicate between them, send messages. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, there is some interaction. There is so some interaction. Yes. So then so th it's, it's somewhere very, it's in between. It's very interesting to think how you could do this. So. Yeah. Uh, what about the case where you have scheduling that is time dependent? Like if you have a work list and the question of who, which thread picks a particular work item depends on how fast they progress relative to each other. Yeah, of course. That's a really great question. So the question you asked was, is actually a really good one um, in a way that that's might not realize right away. So there's a different way to to formulate the question. And one way you could say, I want to know the runtime of an application, right? And if you want to know the whole runtime of the application, you can just look at the work lists and you can feed it through. The, if it's timing dependent, you can use traditional multi-threaded sampling that I introduced in the first half of this talk, okay? But there's another way to look at that problem. Maybe you can look at the individual work items as individual tasks that can be separated from the original application and you would create not a, it wouldn't be a representative application, but you create an, a sort of meta, uh, it's not orthogonal, but it's a separate application that would contain these tasks, right? And they're timing dependent. But what you could do is you could now analyze the tasks individually, right? And by doing that, you can, so it's a different question, I understand. Um, Task-based work stealing, and work stealing in general is a very interesting topic because it's timing dependent and you don't have this nice barrier-based behavior, right? Um, so it would default back to the original sampling methodology if you just use straight sampling. But I would suggest, and we could maybe take this offline, to go to this other approach where maybe you don't need the whole application, but the tasks are sufficient. And if you understand the individual tasks, then you can build up a sort of pseudo representation of the application. So uh, there's definitely research there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, quick one. Quick question, but the answer. <laughs> uh, my question is like 15 minutes. Uh, so, so have you looked at for whenever you're in phases like you know overhead like synchronization libraries or barrier libraries, yeah. just not counting those instructions? No, we're counting those instructions. So uh, I'm saying, but if you, if you didn't, you would actually get you'd actually get true CPI, and that would give you, I think, an accurate um, view no, of forward progress. I don't think so, because if you had mm. mutex, inf mutex communication inside of a barrier region, then that would not hold anymore. Because you can now have spin locks inside of a single barrier region, and those spin locks will then y drive up your IPC, uh, right? Well, okay, okay, now uh, there's a whole question about how much do you want to modify the simulator? Can you detect the, the spin locks and remove them from execution? Of course. If you could detect them, right? I know we don't have to yeah. take okay. 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 <laughs> It's a good question, but you know, many programs have uh, data races that synchronize and it's very hard to detect and all these things. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Let's thank the speaker again. So.